Good morning. morning. Welcome to Zion Lutheran Church in Deerfield Beach, Florida, where following Jesus, we invite, equip, and serve our neighbor and one another. It's good to have you with us both in person and online for this day, the transfiguration of our Lord. A link is available on our website to download the worship bulletin. And so we are happy to have those of you who are with us uh, observing our uh, the guidelines for, for COVID and uh, continue to be safe. And uh, thank you so much for your generosity with that. Let us begin with the thanksgiving for baptism. Please stand as you're able. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the fountain of living water, the rock who gave us birth, our light, and our salvation. Amen. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. Through the waters of the flood, you delivered Noah and his family. Through the sea, you led your people Israel from slavery into freedom. At the river, your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By water in your word, you claim us as daughters and sons, making us inheritors of your promise and servants of all. We praise you for the gift of water that sustains life. And above all, we praise you for the gift of new life in Jesus Christ. Shower us with your spirit and renew our lives with your forgiveness, grace, and love. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. So they came to Jericho. 
The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to the one side and to the other until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing. Yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As I continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to join me in reading responsibly Psalm 50, verses 1 through 6. The Mighty One, God the Lord, has spoken, calling the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, perfect in its beauty, God shines forth in glory. Our God will come and will not keep silence with the consuming flame before and round about a raging storm. God calls the heavens and the earth from above to witness the judgment of the people. Gather before me my loyal followers, those who have made a covenant with me and sealed it with sacrifice. The heavens declare the righteousness of God's cause, for it is God who is judge. Our second reading is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 to 6. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us stand as we're able for the gospel acclamation. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. 
The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Let us pray. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall proclaim your praise. May your word be my word. And may the thoughts and meditation of our minds and hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, for you are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Today we observe one of the ultimate epiphanies, the transfiguration of our Lord Jesus. And remember that the very nature of an epiphany is a revealing, a revelation with an aha attached. It's significant enough of an event that it's also included not only in, in the gospel according to Mark, but the gospel according to Matthew and the one according to Luke. All three accounts are preceded by Jesus telling his disciples that he is going to have to undergo suffering, be killed, and be raised on the third day. And in Matthew and Mark, Peter objects to Jesus saying this, saying, God forbid that ever happens to you. He refuses to accept that this must happen. Jesus tells him he's in his way if he doesn't allow this to happen. As Brandon Diebert lifts up from his research, this transfiguration is about three years into Jesus' three and a half year ministry. He says for months and years, those disciples had followed Jesus. They had seen his miracles. They had done miracles in his name. They knew something palpably and objectively about the power and the reality of who Jesus was. And yet, when he began to talk about dying, it was staggering to the disciples. It threw them off and they began to wonder if he was really the Messiah. This and Peter's response to Jesus may be reasons that Jesus takes Peter as well as James and John with him up to that high mountain. Peter and the other two need to see. They need to see. They need an aha moment to reset them in line with Jesus. The mountain was most likely Mount Hermon which is near Caesarea Philippi, which is where Jesus and his disciples had been. It's 9,000 feet high. If they were to go all the way to the top of Mount Hermon, it's about a mile and three quarters, quite a hike. There are other scholars that have said in the past that they thought it was Mount Tabor that they went to. And while that mountain is strategically high for the area it's in, it's substantially smaller than Mount Hermon. Now, when a mountain shows up in the Bible, most times it's a significant encounter. Most times it's an encounter with the Lord God. It, it tends to be where remarkable things with God happen. So Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up that mountain. And there they see Jesus standing before them. And all of a sudden, there's a manifestation of light and glory that defies description. The best that can be said is that it was so blindingly bright, it was like the ultimate bleached fabric. This glory is a visual foretaste of what is to come. And for a limited time only, they see him transfigured. The, the word actually in the Greek is metamorphosed, metamorphized, like metamorphosis. The point is that the caterpillar has become a butterfly. And then they see Elijah and Moses talking with Jesus. And how, how they knew the identity of those two men could only be because insight was given to them. How would they know who were these two guys with Jesus? Unless they somehow instinctively knew. I mean, they weren't wearing name tags saying, hello, my name is Elijah. Hello, my name is Moses. 
Earlier in Mark, in chapter 9, Elijah's name had been raised. Herod, the ruler, the tetrarch, had heard rumors that Elijah had appeared. And when Jesus asked his disciples who people said he was, they told him that some of the people thought he was Elijah. Elijah was believed to be the one coming before the Messiah, the anointed one, the Christ. Elijah represented the prophets, and Moses represented the law, the Torah, the one who in obedience to God led the people of Israel out of slavery to freedom. These were visual, tangible signs of who Jesus was. And it was the big reveal for a moment. The whole purpose of that experience was to reinforce, to shore up a staggering faith of those apostles, to get them on solid footing again. Why? Because the mantle was going to be passed on to them. That phrase, some of you may have heard it before, passing the mantle, taking up the mantle, it's been used for generations in general society, not just in churches, and, and it means to assume a role of leadership that someone else once had. It can also be used to say, pick up the mantle, carry the mantle, assume the mantle, to fully understand it, it's important to know that mantle refers to a kind of article of clothing. It's, it's like a, a, an overcoat or a cloak that is put on someone. And this idiom comes from the Bible. Most people, when they say someone's passing the mantle or, or take up the mantle, they don't realize it, but it comes from the Bible from today's first reading. And we heard that when Elijah when going to the Jordan River, took off his cloak, his mantle, rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to the one side and to the other until the two of them crossed on dry ground. Now, if we've been aware of any stories in the Bible, we are meant to think of when Joshua and the people of Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground to enter Canaan. To think of Moses parting the Red Sea and the people passing through it on dry ground. To think of Moses using his staff when he was before Pharaoh of Egypt to enact those wonders. We are to think not of Elijah's power, but we are to think of the power of God. And when Elijah asks Elisha what he should give him, Elisha doesn't ask for his cloak. He asks for a double share of Elijah's spirit. That double share says something also. The inheritance that it was due to a firstborn son was a double share of the inheritance. So he was saying again something significant in asking for that double share. And Elijah, Elijah says, it's not for me to give. That's for God to give. And if God wants to give it to Elisha, Elisha will know if he sees Elijah taken from him. The first reading is cut off too soon. I don't know why they did it, but they cut it off a couple of verses too early. Because the next verses say, Elijah, Elisha, after Elijah was taken up in the whirlwind, Elisha then picked up Elijah's cloak, his mantle, that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah? He asked. When he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed over. The company of the prophets from Jericho who were watching said, the spirit of Elijah is resting on Elisha. So Elisha picked up this mantle to wear and he also took over Elijah's role as prophet. And he's transformed in an obvious way to the company of prophets who were there. He's transformed in response to an encounter with God's glory. Think about your life. Who have been the guides and mentors who have led the way for you? 
Have you ever been asked to pick up the mantle from one of them? Did you feel ready to accept the responsibility on more than one occasion when someone is dying? You'll hear them say to one of their children, you are now the woman of the house. You are now the man of the house. That is passing on that mantle. If you have been asked to pick up that mantle, did you feel ready to take on the responsibility? In this time, as the people of Zion, is there a passing of the mantle? Has the mantle been laid down at some point, waiting for who knows how long for someone to pick it up? Maybe waiting for you. Maybe waiting for you and others. Lauren Lorenz has said, if no one picks up the mantle that the leader has left behind, the mission and purpose of that leader's life just died with them. And this isn't just about organizations and institutions, he says. We can, say this play, we can see this play out in families. When a matriarch or patriarch is no longer with us in our own families, we can contemplate how we honor their life and legacy. How do we pick up the mantle, she says, that they may have left behind? What does that look like? She goes on to say, from our Christian lens, we realize that leadership must be about empowering people to carry on the mission of the church. Jesus had 12 disciples for a reason and didn't attempt to go about his work alone. It was the 11 disciples who carried on his teachings when Jesus was no longer physically present, walking around with them, healing and teaching. The Apostle Paul taught that leadership is about equipping the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Equipping the saints, where have we heard that before? We say that in our mission statement. It's part of our following Jesus is to equip. Lauren points out, if that work of ministry only centers around a minister or church staff, the work won't continue past their tenures, no matter how long or short they happen to stay in that ministry setting. We're called to equip the saints for the work of ministry, not do the work of ministry alone. Doing the ministry alone is an unhealthy model, she says, and yikes, it leads to bitterness and burnout. As my father always says, no one is irreplaceable and you got to lead with humility. We can't be afraid to collaborate and share the work. And that's why the story of Elijah and Elisha is so overpowering and empowering. Elijah's gone. He's not coming back anytime soon. And Elisha could have seen his mantle on the ground and walked away entirely. He could have said, no to being the prophet that God was calling him to be. He had free will, we all do, except he says yes. Elisha picks up the mantle, the symbol of Elijah's authority and power, and he makes that mantle his own. Now he doesn't completely discard the past because he knows there's power there. Holding the past in his hands, he crosses to the other side of the Jordan River and steps into the future. It's one of those beautiful both and moments. Feeling empowered by what was and empowered by what may yet be. The mantle is before us. Will we pick it up? not relying on someone else to do it. Will you? From a cloud there came a voice, this is my son, the beloved, listen to him. Maybe now would be a good time. Maybe now is the time. And to that may all God's people say, Let us stand as we're able for the hymn of the day.
faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Guided by Christ, made known to the nations, let us offer our prayers for the Church, the world, and all people in need. For the Gospel proclaimed in word and deed, for communities of faith far and near, and for all who show the face of Christ throughout the world, let us pray, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For creation, sun, moon, and stars, life forming in the dark earth and ocean deep, mountains, clouds, and storms, and creatures seen and unseen, and for the Holy Spirit's guidance in our care of God's creation, let us pray, Lord, in your mercy. For those responsible for safety and protection, for emergency responders and security guards, attorneys and advocates, civil servants and leaders of governments, that they may witness to mercy and justice throughout the world, let us pray, Lord, in your mercy. For all who suffer this day, especially Guy, Judy, Anne, Michelle, Courtney, and Ben, Susie, Lily, Matt, Luke, Sarah, Brenda and Michael, Cindy, Sherry, Susan, Steve, Alyssa, Jennifer, Laura, Nick, Debbie, Eileen, Roe, Rosie, Pete, Carol, Billy, Maggie, Pastor Fred, Pat, Ted, David, Candace and family, Katie, Todd and Debbie, Colton, all those suffering and recovering from COVID-19, and those we name now silently in our hearts. That Christ our healer transforms sickness into health, loneliness into companionship, bereavement into consolation, and suffering into peace, let us pray. Lord, in your mercy. For us, reveal what can be done for, with, and by the congregations of Mandarin of Jacksonville and Spirit of Life of Jacksonville. Thank you for their partnership with us. Bless all who call, gather, and then are sent by you to proclaim Christ. Lord, in your mercy. For companions on life's journey in this worshiping community, for loved ones who cannot be with us this day, and for guidance during struggles we face that God's glory is revealed around and among us, let us pray, Lord, in your mercy. For those in relationships, that they may be healthy and loving, and for those not in relationships, that they may be experiencing solitude rather than loneliness, Lord, in your mercy. The United States of America, as we observe President's Day tomorrow, Continue to instill the humility that George Washington had to desire to be president rather than king, and the desire for justice combined with unity that Abraham Lincoln brought to his presidency. Instill that not only in our president, but all the elected leaders of this country. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people, spoken or silent, for the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us share that peace with those around us. From a safe distance, of course. You may be seated as we ponder this time of how God offers the Lord Jesus to us, how God offers love and unconditional forgiveness to us, how God offers and provides what we need that we may also share it with others.
Please stand as you're able. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom, and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. May be seated. Let us pray. 
Christ Jesus, at this table we have feasted on your very life and are strengthened for our journey. Send us forth from this banquet nourished in body and in spirit to proclaim your good news and serve others in your name. Amen. A few announcements before you go. First, happy Valentine's Day. I, I don't know if, if you remember or engaged in it, but I remember back when I was in elementary school and we had to make a Valentine's box and we had to write Valentine's to everybody whether we liked them or not. <laughs> and actually, that's not such a bad practice nowadays as Christians is to write those Valentines to everybody whether we like them or not, right? We're called to do that, to love everybody. So, don't have to like them, but we need to love them. And so, happy Valentine's Day. Uh, President's Day is tomorrow. Those of you who get that as a holiday, glad that you do that. Uh, from last Sunday, Super Bowl, $250 was donated from Zion, through Zion, to ELCA World Hunger, yes! And also remember that there was there was a competition between uh, the Synod where the Kansas City Chiefs are and, and our Florida Bahamas Synod, and, and together they raised $23,478 for world hunger. Yes. So together, for the sake of the world, that, that's pretty awesome. And if you haven't contributed, you still can do that online. Uh, there's an ELCA World Hunger spot on, on the fund that you can give, and 100% of those donations will go directly to combating hunger in the United States and around the world. You're invited to join us after worship today as we dedicate and bless the statue of Christ in the Memorial Garden that replaces the one that had been weathered, worn, and broken by the elements. And thank you again to all those who contributed not only their monies, but also their efforts to make it possible. And following that, there will also be a burning of last year's palms to make the ashes for Ash Wednesday, which is this coming Wednesday, just a few days from now. And worship for Ash Wednesday will be at 5.30 in the evening, and there will be an opportunity for those who can't join us for worship for a drive up for ashes from 4 to 5.15. There's more information on that, and everything else that's going on for Lent in, in, on the web page. Also, you can find some of it on our Facebook page and also in the weekly news that Kurt Schmidt sends out for us. That Tuesday, also known as Shrove Tuesday, is this Tuesday. And traditionally, it's a time to have pancakes, to use up all the fats in the house. And whether you make pancakes at home or whether you go to IHOP or someplace like that, Take a photo, send it to hashtag Zion Loves Pancakes. I know it's cheesy. It's not appropriate to say cheesy, even if it's hand, uh, pancakes. It's cheesy to do, but it's just kind of fun. Send it to Kurt Schmidt for us to share. Thursday, February 18th. Things are just loaded up this week. It, at 7 o'clock this Thursday, there's a Zoom presentation from Trustbridge for us, allowing abundance into your life. You can learn how to open yourself to abundant happiness, love, relationships, and health. And our time together will include breathing techniques, meditation, and the use of primordial sound. So uh, join us for that if you're able. Past presentations can also be accessed on our webpage. Free technology classes for those wanting to learn how to unlock that smartphone of yours. If your phone is smarter than you are, you might want to take advantage of this Tech Fundamentals classes. Uh, they're gonna be once a month, the first Thursday of the month. The first one is on March 4th, so see our webpage for that. And if you're interested in participating in a grief group where you know someone who may be, in order to build a community of mutual support, you can complete a survey on our website or clicking the link on the weekly news sent out by email. And uh, if you know of anyone or if you feel you could benefit from participating, Please share that survey link, and we will be posting the, the date and time that that's gonna be available. We're gonna do a hybrid, so we'll, for those people who wanna gather in person at a social distance, we'll be doing that, but we'll also have it available on Zoom. 
Our life verse for this week to ponder is Psalm 50, verse 3a. Our God will come and will not keep silence. Exploring membership videos are in the process of being put up online along with study guides to go deeper into content. This is for anyone and everyone to gain new information or refresh what you already know. Congregation Council is going to be approving members at the February Council meeting, which is this Tuesday at 6 o'clock. It will be via Zoom. And new members will be received on next Sunday, February 21st, virtually and in person. So please contact me if you'd like to be one of those received. <coughs> Excuse me. Keep joining us for events like 9.59 on Monday mornings at 9.59, Wednesday evening prayer at the end of the day with Kurt Schmidt at 8 p.m. And please share those opportunities with your family and friends, as well as, yep, our Youth Empowerment Project is meeting on Zoom every Friday at 4 p.m. We can always use someone to greet and take temperatures at our in-person worship next Sunday, as well as this coming Wednesday. So please let us know if you're able to do that. And with that being said, a final thank you as always for the generosity that I witness every, every week and even during the week from people in terms of time and resources that make it possible for us to continue to reach so many people with the good news of Jesus Christ. So thank you for that. And now I invite you to stand as you're able to receive our Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In terms of the Alleluia, it's time to say goodbye to our friend the Alleluia, to let it rest for a while so that it will return to us at Easter full of enthusiasm to remind us again who we really are, loved children of God. So as we sing this song, we say goodbye to the Alleluia for now as we prepare our hearts for the season of Lent. Peace be the light of Christ. Thanks be to God.